Yes, it's Monday, and we know what that means by now. We're going to talk about ghosts, but we're not just going to talk about ghosts alone, and it's not just going to be my own dulcet tones that you're going to hear, because it's a special episode. Hooray! Don't worry, we're still going to say thank you to our Patreons, we're still going to sing a little song, and we will still end with a rather hungover Becca's Reddit Corner, and I'm not the one who's hungover. You may not be surprised to hear. Now, how this extra special and probably lengthy episode has come about is last month Chris, who's the host of the They're Not Shadows podcast, a paranormal story podcast, don't you know, got in touch to say he was about to celebrate his 100th episode, which is a milestone in any paranormal podcasting person's other P-word. You know what I mean? No, it is a big milestone because many podcasts don't last more than, I think, something like 10 episodes. And then they give up the ghost, pardon the paranormal pun. Too many P words? Tell you what, I'm popping all over the place. But forgive my plethora of podcasting ponderances as I explain that basically what Chris said is he would like it if a lot of shows combined to give one paranormal tale. Now, he would play that on his show and, you know, we'd all, like a good paranormal community should, we'd all mix listeners, etc, etc. So, you're going to hear a story today from me. Yes, the paranormal purveyor, which is Kev Eustace of We Need to Talk About Ghosts. My paranormal podcasting brothers in arms, the ghost story guys, Brennan and Paul. We're also going to hear from It's Haunted, What Now? We Need to Talk About Ghosts. Oh, that's me. I've just said that. Weekly Creep, You See Me in the Dark, Haunted Happenstance, Real Life Ghost Stories with the pod mother, Emma herself, our favourite person in the land. Then They're Not Shadows, of course, and Southern Gothic. And, you know, it's a good idea because you might not have heard of some of the shows. Obviously, some of the shows you will. Through me, anyway. Well, not through me, but what I mean is... I talk often about the ghost story guys because I love them. I talk often about Emma and real life ghost stories because I love that. And, you know, so some of the shows you'll know, but others you may not and you may not have been exposed to. So it's a good thing. And we're still going to end with Becca's drunken Reddit corner. So, yeah, I think all in all, it's going to be a little bit of a paranormal pot. What's What do they call it in America where you bring a pot of something? Is it a pot roast? I don't know. But it's basically a big paranormal party and you're all invited and I need to cut down on the P-words. Anyway, before I cut down on the P-words totally, we need to say a thank you to our Patreons, which sadly begin with a P. Now, when you sign up to Patreon, you get access to genuinely around 300 hours worth of additional Patreon-only content. And that's because we put out two shows each and every week, and we have done for years. One of them is a midweek ramble where I basically just talk about anything and everything that comes into my brain. Um, Last week's one was done whilst we were on holiday for my birthday in Wales, which featured Becca for the first time on a ramble. And this week's one I recorded yesterday. It went on for a bit. It It got a bit weird, if I'm being honest. But it also came up with a good suggestion that maybe, maybe, in the future we'll start having rambles with listeners and just seeing where it goes, because that could be quite fun. And on a Sunday, we also release a paranormal Patreon where myself and Becca talk about something paranormal, or at least we do our very best to try and stay on topic and do so. And so if you'd like to support the show, get hundreds of hours worth of extra Patreon-only content, and get two extra shows a week, shows, shows turning into Sean Connery and he's dead, two extra shows every week, and of course, get your name sung out as a thank you, thank you very much, then go over to patreon.com forward slash we need to talk about ghosts, just like these wonderful new Patreons have. We have Teresa Wilson, Tom Billington, who I'm sure was the dynamite kid, and Irish wristwatch. And it's like a tongue twister that, but it's not Irish wristwatch. Irish wristwatch. It it is to me anyway, because I can't talk. My tongue's getting worse. I know that's a sentence you won't hear very often. Anyway, the guitar is well and truly out. And what I thought we'd do is go a little bit country. But like, you know when, well, you know when people tell a story as they're playing a chord? Well, I'd like to tell you all a little story about three people who stand up to support a show. 
Now that show's called Talk About Ghosts, so we don't need to talk about ghosts. Yet we do. And it comes from the book and the film, we need to talk about Kevin, because the host name is Kevin, but what he's done is cleverly replace that with ghosts. And anyway, those three people that go by the names of Teresa Wilson, Tom Billington, Irish Wristwatch 2. They've signed up to the Patreon for keeping the show on too. And I want to say thank you From the haunted wood Where I'm clearly singing the song from too But genuinely thank you And it's on an E minus seventh But we are capoed on the third for anyone paying attention Anyway, as I say, if you want to join up, go over to patreon.com forward slash we need to talk about ghosts. Now it is time. It is time to get ourselves into bathing costumes because we're about to plunge into a paranormal pool. Peas again. I don't know what's going on today. Far too many peas. But we are about to take a plunge into a paranormal pool of tales of terror and horror and hopefully introduce you to some new paranormal podcasts. Now, you can't get away from the word, the letter P when you say paranormal podcasts, anyway. But let's begin. Now, we'll start with mine, my submission to uh, Chris's show. And in all honesty, I don't think I got the memo quite right in my own mind, because mine's very short. Everyone else's is like 12 minutes long, and mine's like, oh, yeah, um, I believe in ghosts. Bye! You'll see what I mean. And obviously, forgive me for introducing myself. You know who I am. Oh, shit, what the fuck was that? Paranormal goings on within the recording studio. Something's just fell off a shelf, that's all it was. And there's no cat in the room. Slightly terrifying, but moving evidently quickly on. So without further ado, this is me introducing me and introducing you all to my show. <laughs> we need to talk about ghosts. I hope you find it somewhere and maybe listen to it and like it. Hello, Chris and listeners of They're Not Shadows. My name's Kev from We Need to Talk About Ghosts, and I'm going to regale to you some of the paranormal experiences experienced by my mother. Now, she sadly passed on whilst I was quite young, but she is the reason why I have an interest in the paranormal. She was a believer herself, and she experienced quite a few things. Some of those things I'm going to tell you now. So the first one that jumps out is when she was a teenager, she was babysitting her nieces and nephews and they didn't really come from a well-off area. So when she was babysitting them, they'd all be in the same bed and she recalls falling asleep one night, but waking up because she could hear one of the children giggling and mumbling. And when she turned around, the child was sat up in bed, staring at a rocking chair, which was in the corner and smiling and nodding and laughing with its eyes closed. Thank you very much. And the chair then started to rock. At which point, me mum picked all the kids up, ran downstairs, phoned her uncle, who came over with his Alsatian or German shepherd. You know the type of dog I mean, not afraid of anything. And he comes through the door, he marches upstairs with the dog. The dog dug its claws in at the line of the bedroom. So where that metal strip is, which separates the carpet, it wouldn't go any further and it was whimpering. Now, this was the late 60s. And let's just say that animals weren't treated with the same dignity that we treat them today. So he picks up the animal by its fur and throws it into the room as if to say, what are you scared about? The dog then yelps like it's being kicked, runs past my uncle down the stairs, out through the front door and is found two miles away, completely knackered, completely breathless. It's not stopped running since whatever it encountered in that room. And apparently as the dog ran past my mother's uncle, he turned and watched with his own eyes as the rocking chair continued to rock and then come to a stop. So what was in that room? We'll literally never know. A second tale that she told me was when she was buying shoes for her sister's wedding and my mother's mother died when my mother was about two years old. So she was brought up by her elder sisters. So she never really met her mother in 
true terms. Um, she had no recollection of her. Anyway, she goes to a shoe shop in Liverpool city centre. And it's a quiet morning. She gets up pretty early. She's in the shop for bang on nine o'clock. It's the middle of the week. Town's pretty dead. She goes into this shoe shop and she's looking at the shoes and she's thinking, she's trying to pick which ones. She decides on a pair. And through the rack, she sees this woman and she thinks, I know this woman. I don't know how, but I know this woman. Anyway, the woman walks around the counter and says to her, they don't suit you then, love. I wouldn't buy them. Go with the yellow ones. So my mum goes, oh, OK then. And then picks up the yellow ones and tries them on. And as she's trying them on, she thinks, that's kind of a cheeky thing to say to someone that you don't know. They don't suit you. So she looks up and around and this woman's nowhere to be seen. She goes out of the shop and looks left and right. And given the time scale of the woman saying these words, I mean, mum going out of the shop, there's literally nowhere she could have went. But she wasn't there. Now, when she came back and gave a description of what she was wearing and how her hair was, her two older sisters broke down in tears and said, that was your mum. Your mum's come and gave you advice on shoes to wear for a wedding. So that was another little tidbit that she told me. The final two sort of anecdotes, which are rather short from my mother, was when she and my dad first moved into their first house, which was built on an old ammunition site which was bombed during the war. And it was built as a new estate over this decimated building with God knows how many deaths that took place there. Anyway, this new estate was built, they moved in, and there was a lot of mysterious activity within the house. They'd heard people running up and down the stairs, go and check, there's no one there. And the infamous story she told was of washing her hair over the bath and being slapped on the backside. And she obviously startled, jumped, ran down the stairs to like give me dad a load of grief. And when she burst into the living room, my dad was in the back garden and my young, my elder brother, sorry, who was about six months old, was in his crib. So there was no one else in the house, yet she was slapped on the backside. Now, interestingly, her neighbour at the back of her house used to only do the housework of a night so she would hoover of a night and she would do all the noisy sort of moving things around and wiping windows and anything she could do to stay active and create a bit of noise, which is the key thing, because her partner worked nights. And as cruel as this sounds, she wanted her children to remain awake until her partner returned home so that she wasn't alone in the house with the kids whilst they were asleep. So she would purposefully try and keep them awake by hoovering about 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night. But the reason for this was when she was alone in the house during the day, things would just move of their own accord. If she tried to hoover around the house, the plug would be yanked out of the socket. Lights would go on and off. My mother even went round one afternoon and knocked on the door, didn't get an answer. So peered through the window to see if she was about and looked and seen that she was under the table hiding under the table. So she knocked on the window until she got her attention and she ran to the front door and answered it in a big panicky state and said, something's in the kitchen. It's been throwing pots and pans around. I didn't know what to do. I froze. I jumped under the table and I was just going to wait here until somebody came. And um, when my mum and her went and checked, as she says, there was pots and pans all over the kitchen floor. So yeah, just an interesting few stories there. But as my mother also used to say, it's not the dead we should be afraid of, it's the living. And that is something I truly still believe to this day. She also said, if you want to see a ghost, you will see a ghost. Now, sadly, she's no longer with us, so I don't know exactly what she meant by that. But it probably means it's down to your belief level on what you witness and how you interpret it. But I'll leave you with that. There you go. Tatty bye. Well, that certainly sounds like a show I'd like to check out, says Kev. It's Kev back. Hi. This is as in Kev within today's show. OK, so that's an example of what's going to go on. But much better. Uh, sorry, much more professionally done by other people, as you'd expect, really. Anyway, let's follow on from my tale with none other 
Then the pod mother, everyone please bow, curtsy, as you would, for the one and only Emma from Real Life Ghost Stories. If you don't already listen to Real Life Ghost Stories, then you're a fool. Pardon my French, but you're a fool. So go and check her show out, and this is the wonderful Emma. Hello, my name is Emma and I am the host of Real Life Ghost Stories podcast. Real Life Ghost Stories is a podcast that covers all sorts of spooky stuff, all sorts of spooky goodness. Every Sunday I do a deep dive into a famous paranormal case or claim and every Wednesday and Friday I release a mini episode that is chock full of listener stories. The story that you are going to hear from Real Life Ghost Stories podcast comes from episode number 181, The Connecticut Dolls, which is all about an old poltergeist story that I unearthed in my travels and I hope you enjoy it. Mesmerism is not a term that we use particularly regularly in today's modern parlance. But in the 18th century, it was all the rage and was at the forefront of contemporary psychology. The technique was popularised in the 1700s by Franz Anton Mesmer and was used as a way to cure people of various ailments. Mesmer believed that animal magnetism was the key to this cure and the procedure involved the application of magnets to the part of the patient's body that was affected by the particular ailment and then the patient would be put into a trance-like state by gazing into their eyes and making what he called magnetic passes over them with his hands. It was so popular that the words mesmerised and variations of it have stuck around, and eventually mesmerism was superseded by what we now know as hypnotism. The reason we have to start here is that I need to explain to you what kind of man Reverend Eliakim Phelps was. It was 1850, and Reverend Phelps was a very well-respected man, but he was also a great believer in all things paranormal, which, in 1850, would not have been wholly unusual. He was a practitioner of mesmerism and would cure people of various ailments using the method, so it's safe to say that the forces of good and evil and non-scientific reasons for various phenomena were a pretty substantial part of his life. Later in life, Reverend Phelps had married for a second time and the woman he married was a widow with four children. The children were a girl aged 16, a boy aged 11, a girl aged 6 and another boy aged 3. And our story begins on the 10th of March 1850. It was a Sunday in Stratford, Connecticut and the weather was beginning to turn You could feel a tiny hint of warmth in the crisp spring air and a breeze blustered as the Phelps family made their way home after church. People of the town called their greetings and blessings to the Reverend and his family as they made their way home. The second that the Reverend opened the door to their home, he realised that something was very wrong. Their house had been ransacked and his heart sank as he realised that someone must have broken into the house while the family was at church. He urged his family to wait at the door, and as they craned their necks to see the carnage inside, he took a slow, cautious step into the house, feeling a mixture of panic and confusion, but trying to remain calm and clear-headed. He worried that the perpetrator would be inside. Was it someone who was looking for something? Maybe someone passing through the town and saw an opportunity or someone who bore a grudge against him or his family. But surely that was impossible. As he made his way from room to room, the different possible scenarios vied for attention in his head. Each room had been ransacked, with furniture flung around and the contents of drawers and cupboards strewn all over the floors. He moved through the house room by room and he placed the palm of his hand on a door and slowly pushed it open to survey the damage. But what he saw in that room made him catch his breath. He held the door open, not daring to take a step inside while his brain tried to comprehend what he was seeing. In the room, a scene had been painstakingly created and for a brief moment... 
he thought that the room was full of women. Real women. But they weren't real. These women were dolls. Well, almost like dolls. They were women that had been painstakingly fashioned out of clothes and items of fabric that were clearly belonging to the Phelps family home. The women were littered around the room in poses of extreme devotion, on their knees praying, some with their arms out and their foreheads touching the floor. Some of the figures were kneeling with Bibles open in front of them. Phelps stepped into the room and looked at the Bible verses, immediately desperate for some clue as to what was happening here. The Bibles were all opened on pages with verses that seemed to reference paranormal phenomenon. As the Reverend surveyed the scene, he counted that there were ten female figures and one male. And then something else. Something in the middle of the circle of worship that was not like the others. It was a small, goblin-like creature. Smaller than the others and truly grotesque. And suspended above it was an even smaller figure. Like a puppet. Phelps stepped backwards out of the room and shut the door. It's hard to imagine how any of us would respond in that situation. The family had been at church, all together, and someone had somehow entered their home and ransacked it, but had also created this elaborate and strange tableau. Whatever had happened, he needed to figure it out for the safety of his family, and what he did next is the reason that we even know this story today. He got other learned people involved in an attempt to solve the mystery. His first port of call was a man named Dr. Webster, another well-respected man in the community who knew both the Reverend and his family. Dr. Webster ended up being so struck by the events of the next 18 months that he wrote extensively about it in the New Haven Journal and Courier. A watch was set up to try and establish who was responsible for these events, but the figures continued to appear. Rooms that were closed and monitored would suddenly have these figures appear inside them. Webster noted that the figures were made from materials that were gathered from all over the house and that so many figures were constructed in such a small space of time that it would have taken several people working steadily for several hours to pull it off. The figures varied from being beautiful and grotesque and were always arranged in some sort of scene. It is estimated that during this period of time, approximately 30 individual intricate figures were created. One of the Phelps sons was led into one of the rooms to survey the scene and ran straight to what he believed was his mother kneeling in prayer in the room. As he grabbed her joined hands, he reeled back in shock as the material crumpled in his little hands and he realised that it wasn't his mother at all but yet another figurine that despite being made from fabric was lifelike enough to fool him. They were made with great skill and care and didn't seem to be thrown together in a haphazard fashion. The fact that this child could mistake one of these figures for his own mother demonstrates how accurate and lifelike they actually were. And the figures weren't the only disturbance in the house. Webster wrote in his report of the events that, quote, for about 18 months, violent movements and disturbances were renewed with extreme frequency and force. Objects of all kinds were thrown around the house by what seemed to be invisible hands. Window panes were broken and great damage was done to the walls and furnishings of the home. Rappings were constantly heard and these sometimes gave intelligent and sometimes blasphemous answers to questions that were asked. It seemed from Webster's report that the Phelps family were at war with something disturbing, invisible and otherworldly, and something that desperately wanted to communicate with them, and would go to any lengths to do so. But life had to continue as normal for the Phelps family too, In all of the worry about the strange events in the home, life goes on. Reverend Phelps needed to continue his work and his writings, 
The children needed to be fed and educated and the household needed to be ran efficiently. Reverend Phelps sat alone in his office writing, hunched over his desk. The only sound was the furious scratching of his pen as he worked diligently, his hand racing across the pages. The house was calm and quiet, which seemed like a luxury these days, and for once he allowed his mind to focus on his work rather than the horror of the invisible aggressor that had moved in with them. He briefly stopped writing, paused for a second in his chair before standing up and moving to his impressive array of books that sat on his shelves. He ran his finger along them before settling on a book and taking it down. As he opened it, he became aware of another sound in the room other than the rustle of turning pages. It was the scratching of his pen on the paper. He turned around and there was no one in his seat and the pen was lying lifeless where he had left it. But when he approached his desk, cautiously he realised that his page was now covered in writing that wasn't there a mere minute before. The Reverend ran his fingers softly over the newly formed words and the ink stained his fingers. It was not yet dry. This was finished mere seconds before and the words... The words were a strange jumble of words and phrases and symbols that he didn't understand. It was the words and symbols that were a repeated pattern, but none of the family or observers could have expected what happened next, as the invisible aggressor attempted to communicate yet again. It was again a calm and quiet evening, and the family were allowing themselves to be a normal family. It was one of the children that spotted it first as he dropped to his knees to examine something that seemed to be growing from the carpet. Mother? There are plants in the carpet. And there are pictures on the leaves. Mrs Phelps looked at her husband and he looked back at her. What did that possibly mean? As they looked at the carpet, they realised that green shoots had sprung up everywhere, all over the carpet. They dropped to the floor to examine the plants further, and on the leaves were strange symbols. Some form of hieroglyphic-style pictures that were indecipherable. None of the family spoke as they looked at the plants, all completely enraptured by what they were seeing. They didn't recognise the plants. They didn't understand what the symbols were on the leaves or how they got there. The silence was only broken when the smash of shattering glass heralded that yet something else had been hurled through a window. What is remarkable about this case is that the witness testimonies came thick and fast. One witness named Mr H.B. Taylor reported that he saw the following. Quote, In my presence... The elder boy was carried across the room by invisible hands and deposited gently on the floor. A supper table was raised and tipped over when the room was completely empty to people. In one instance, the boy's clothes were cut to ribbons. In the presence of several persons, articles moved through the air and a brass candlestick fell from the mantelpiece and continued to dash itself against the floor until broken. A shovel and tong set moved out of the fireplace and then proceeded to hop about and dance in the middle of the floor. A heavy dining room table was raised into the air and a lamp moved across the room and set fire to some papers. On a later occasion, the boy was found hung to a tree and the elder girl, while sleeping, had a pillow pressed over her head and tape tied around her neck which nearly strangled her. Another report came from Professor Austin Phelps, who was the son of Reverend Phelps from his previous marriage. He reported that, quote, On one occasion, when Reverend Phelps was alone, walking across the room, a key and a nail flew over his head and fell at his feet. That same evening, in the presence of the whole family, a turnip fell from the ceiling. Spoons and forks flew from the table into the air, and one day, six or eight spoons were taken up at once, bent double by the invisible agency, and thrown at those in the room. On another occasion when Reverend Phelps was alone, he was directed by the raps to put his hand under the table and his hand was grasped by what seemed to be a human hand, warm and soft. 
Most of the raps purported to come from a Frenchman named D, who had been a clerk for a firm of lawyers who had handled a settlement for Mrs. Phelps. D asserted that he was in hell because he had cheated in the drawing of the settlement papers. Reverend Phelps investigated and did find that there had been fraud perpetrated, though not involving a sum sufficiently large enough to warrant a prosecution. A Reverend Charles Beecher made similar statements about the legitimacy of the case in a report published in 1879, and a man named Andrew Jackson Davis visited the family in Stratford and believed that the phenomena was the result of psychic manifestations from the eldest boy and girl in the household, although he absolutely insisted the events were paranormal. The New York Sun published an article on April 29, 1850, in which the journalist, Mr Beach, reported that he was witness to the paranormal phenomena in the house. He visited the house in the early days of the events, and the elder boy was sitting up in bed with a number of adults in the room investigating the phenomena. They watched as a matchbox fell from the mantelpiece with a bizarrely loud thunk. All eyes were on it as it slid across the floor and under the boy's bed. The boy began to scream and cry that he was being burned and upon investigation some paper under the bed had been set on fire and was burning away beneath it. Mr Beach also reported witnessing spontaneous injuries appear on the elder girl. For example she would complain of feeling as though she was being pinched and when she rolled up her sleeves there were vivid red marks on her arms. The New Haven Journal also reported that they witnessed the girl being spontaneously injured, with her screaming in her bedroom, claiming that she had been slapped in the face and a large red welt appeared on her face. When the reporter watched the family try and comfort her, a porcelain jug rose from a table, floated in the air for a few seconds before being smashed on the ground with huge force. But eventually... The activity in the house began to subside, and in October 1851, around 18 months after the activity started, it stopped altogether. The response was mixed. When the stories were reported in newspapers and journals, people were quick to suggest that the children were very clearly the perpetrators of a clever hoax. But Reverend Phelps insisted that it just wasn't possible. And another witness, Reverend John Mitchell, reported that he accompanied the family to and from their home and he witnessed the house being intact upon leaving and then being ransacked when they returned. And he insisted that it was not possible that any of the family were responsible. They were all out of the house at the time. And he also claimed to have witnessed writing appearing on the walls and the clothing of the family when none of the family were in the house. There you go. So what do you make of that then? I'll tell you what you make of that. You go over and you subscribe to Real Life Ghost Stories. Because Emma's amazing. I need to try and do something, or we need to try and sort something out again. You know the way we done the Haunted Hotel last year? And we had a ball, and it was dead good. And we always have a good laugh. So we'll have to try and sort something out with our good friend, Ms. Emma. Anyway... We're going to leave the pod mother on her rightful throne and we're going to head over and lay down the red carpet for the man with the coolest voice in all of paranormal podcasting. I am, of course, talking about Brennan Store and Paul Bestel. Now, two people can't have the coolest voice. Sorry, Paul, you don't have the coolest voice. I'm, cu- I'm talking about Brennan. And I'm going to do Brennan impression. My name's Brennan Store, and welcome to the Ghost Story Guys. That wasn't good enough. And by the way, I'm not saying Paul doesn't have a cool voice. It's just not Brennan Store from the Ghost Story Guys. That was terrible. I can normally do such a better Brennan. Anyway, there's the man himself. And if you don't listen and subscribe to these guys already, you are missing out. I don't know what accent that was. It was kind of Cornish. Anyway, here's the GSG. Hey, I'm Brennan Store. I'm Paul Bestel. And we're the Ghost Story Guys. This story comes from our episode, The Mystery of Missing Time. It's called Orange Light. 
My parents live in a large house in Pennsylvania that backs up to a large wooded area and one house that sits a bit farther back than ours into the woods. The downstairs is probably 2,500 to 3,000 square feet and there are numerous big windows, including bay windows in the living room above the blinds that look out into the woods. This probably happened about nine years ago. My sister was around 11 or 12 and I was about 20. I was watching her a couple nights while my parents were out of town. It's worth noting that my parents never went away, so I do find it odd that it happened the one time they did. It wasn't too late at night, maybe around 11, and we were sitting with every light off downstairs, specifically watching lightning bugs out those big bay windows and just talking. All of a sudden, there was a huge burst of orange light with no sound that filled up the entire downstairs like someone had turned the lights on, but even brighter than normal. It was almost a deep orange, and my first reaction was that our house, or the neighbor's house behind us, had caught on fire. We both got up to run outside, and that's the last memory I have of that evening. I know we woke up the next day as normal, went to my old high school's basketball game and had people over after. There was absolutely no discussion about the night before. Fast forward to about two years ago. My sister, who was now about 18, and I were sitting around the kitchen center island talking. All of a sudden, I got a burst of memories from that night, but only what I just mentioned above. I blurted out to my sister, Wait, what happened that night with the orange light? And she immediately knew what I was talking about. Turns out she had had a memory just the night before that she didn't connect until that moment. Here we had seven years since this incident, where we both never said a word to each other, and then we both suddenly had memories within the same 24 hours. It's worth saying that my sister can be oddly psychic and just aware of things that are completely foreign or unknown to others. She also reported seeing things in our house as a kid. Her vision, or dream, from the night before was of us running out the back door, which we ran out of that evening, and there being a large green glowing orb on the driveway. That's where her vision ends. It wasn't until I brought up the orange light that it clicked in her head that that was that night. I guess she was viewing it as just a dream before, but in that moment she realized it was actually a memory. What's especially weird about all this is that my sister and I are very interested in the paranormal, especially things which are space related, and there is absolutely no way we would have just walked back in after that odd experience and gotten in bed without any discussion. I know we would have offered many theories, as we have now, instead of just ignoring it and getting in our separate beds. What's also weird is that my sister and I both never go to bed before midnight 1am, and if I'm home, we usually sleep in the same bed, falling asleep watching a movie or something. Given where we woke up the next morning, I know for sure that we went to our own beds that night. I've tried to rationalize what happened, like thinking about headlights turning around in the further house's driveway, but they don't match the lights at all. I mean, this was like a nuclear explosion bright, lighting the entire downstairs a deep, deep orange. However, even more than that, I'm weirded out by our completely uncharacteristic reaction to what happened. The reason I chose that particular story out of our archive is I have had my own green light experience, and I don't know that I would say it's specifically UFO related, but it was unusual and I don't have an explanation for it. If you'd like to know more about that, come check out me and Paul over on the Ghost Story Guys podcast, or check out my book, A Strange Little Place. The Paranormal Secrets of Revelstoke, British Columbia. Yes, and as Brennan rightly signs off there, you do need to go and check out the Ghost Story Guys. Because what you get with the Ghost Story Guys, which is a rather unique thing in terms of... A, yeah, normally when you have a duo podcast, and by duo, obviously, I mean two hosts, it's normally just banterific. Do you know what I mean? And then there's the odd story, then there's banterific. Now, although obviously they have a great camaraderie and they do have a good laugh, you also get, like, Paul Bestel is genuinely and sincerely, in my opinion, one of the most educated people in terms of the majority of paranormality. And therefore, when something comes up that Brennan might not, you know, have heard of before or something... He can pull from that font of knowledge that is Paul's brain. And it's a really good sort of mix. It's very good. It's an excellent podcast and they're genuinely good people. So 
go and check it out. Also, in terms of uh, podcasting audio quality, it, you're not going to beat it. You're genuinely not going to beat it. I know um, Brennan's particularly, I don't want to say anal, but he's particularly, you know, on to delivering a top quality audio sound. So don't worry about any sorts of amateurish sounds coming through. It's going to be spot on when you listen. So go check them out, the Ghost Story Guys. Okay, so what have we got next in this party of paranormal plethora, P-word, pa 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 We have Brandon from Southern Gothic. Now, Southern Gothic is new to me. New to me, my everything, the sweetest song that I can sing, oh baby. And it is an excellent show. If you like your stories to be told like you feel like you're in a campfire, oh, put it this way, if I was going on a long drive in the middle of the night through a deserted wood, I probably wouldn't put this on because I would poo my holy pants. But, um... He's an excellent storyteller, some lovely, lovely um, like background spooky noises and stuff. And yeah, even I was introduced in this format, what we're doing now to this show. So it proves it works. And this is Southern Gothic. Hey, y'all. I'm Brandon Schecksnyder from the podcast Southern Gothic. I've got a little story for you from out in West Virginia. Back in the early 19th century, before coal became king and West Virginia was even a state, most folks who came out to this neck of the woods were homesteaders, self-reliant settlers looking to own a piece of land, farm it, and make a life for themselves without all the trappings of city life. So men like Berg Hammond helped them. Hammond was a peddler, a traveling salesman who meandered his way through the region in a wagon filled with items that you otherwise couldn't find unless you took the long journey into town. He sold all sorts of things from clothing to kitchenware, household goods, and even toys. And to folks he sold to, the arrival of his horse-drawn wagon was a welcome sight for sore eyes. The Encyclopedia of West Virginia quotes a woman who grew up in a rural county during the 1880s as saying that visits from peddlers like Berg, quote, gave us something to look forward to. It was almost like having Santa Claus come. We loved to see the big bundle opened up, for we seldom saw new things. But Berg was a little different than some of his peers, because not only did he bring all sorts of traditional wares, but he also carried with him a number of musical instruments, all of which he knew how to play. And for this reason, he didn't really think of himself as a peddler the way his customers did. He believed he was a creative, a musician, out on the road, entertaining folks everywhere he went. But of all the instruments he carried and played, the one that gave him the biggest draw was the fiddle. This, of course, made the sight of Berg coming into a town an even bigger treat than most. He was always received with the utmost excitement, and got numerous invitations to stay the night at a local farmer's house, have a hot meal, and a soft bed. But as you can imagine, life on the road out there wasn't easy. Communities were few and far between, and it would sometimes take Berg days to travel between them, on seldom used dirt roads winding through the treacherous mountains of Appalachia. And this was all in a heavy wagon pulled by a couple of old horses. This was a lonely life, and it's no wonder why Berg picked up the fiddle. Unfortunately, after years of making his way through these mountains, the fiddler's good fortune came to an end. According to local lore, one evening Berg was caught out in the rain while traveling along the winding roads of Bud Mountain. Their way over the peak, he might find a dry place to stop and spend the night. He pressed on. But as the sun began to fade, a deep fog set in, and the path became more and more dangerous as rain fell harder and harder. 
Berg had no light to guide him, and although he had traveled these roads many times over the years, he soon found that he had somehow drifted off the worn path. It was then, amidst the confusion and darkness, that his horses got spooked. They reared up in terror with fear-filled neighs as Berg attempted to regain control of his wagon. But after sliding backward, it began to tumble down the steep side of Bud Mountain. It took quite a bit of time before folks realized that their favorite fiddle-playing peddler was missing. And it took even longer for them to find him. And when they finally did, they discovered what they had feared. Berg and his horses had met their fate on that stormy night. Yet in spite of his death, old Berg Hammond wasn't done sawing on that fiddle, and it wasn't long till people started to notice. Folks who knew him claimed to hear those familiar melodies echoing through the air on stormy nights. And to this very day, locals claim that he'll even play for you on demand if you just go ahead and ask. Berg Hammond, let's hear some of those pretty tunes. Thank you, Brandon, and what an amazing little story. Now, as I say... If I was driving alone in a dark place listening to that, I'd have to ring me dad afterwards and be like, can you tell me something nice? But an excellent story and an excellent podcast. Go check out Southern Gothic. Although I do have a vision of camping in that area with all my mates drunk and the battery dies on whatever music we're listening to and then just shouting into the woods, can you play whiskey in a jar? And then um, all boogieing to a ghostly band. I don't know. Either way, go check out Southern Gothic. So what's next when we open the paranormal picnic, P-words, honestly, and unravel this piece of tinfoil? Why, it's Jennifer from Haunted Happenstance. Now, Haunted Happenstance is a show where Jennifer tells us some terrifying tales in a very dulcet-toned way, in a way which I would listen to this to go to bed. And I don't mean because it'll put you to sleep. I mean, because it's very atmospheric. It's, um, you know, she's got a very soothing voice. And also, you'll probably have nightmares. And who doesn't want a good nightmare? So this is Haunted Happenstance. Hey there, I'm Jennifer, and I host Haunted Happenstance, a creepy and quirky little audio drama set in a historic residence in Boston, Massachusetts. You see, I've always loved a good ghost story, and as it turns out, ghosts have always loved me too. Convenient? Maybe. Coincidence? Perhaps. But I think it's a bit more than that. Let's see if you agree. So sit back and get ready to join me, and my neighbors, for some truly spooky tales that can only be explained as haunted happenstance. You can find us on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever else you find your podcasts. I stared at the clock on my bedside. It was 11.56 p.m. on Monday, September 30th, 2019, four minutes away from October the 1st. Sure, I was looking forward to the month, even more so for real fall to hopefully creep in, but I was not looking forward to what else I knew would be creeping in at exactly midnight. I stared out into the all-but-black space that was our lofted condo, the slightest sliver of hazy light slipping in under the front door from the perma-lit brick hallway, and I just clicked my tongue lightly, almost mimicking a countdown ticker. At least this year I had a plan. I was pretty certain it wouldn't last the whole month, but any day that it did work was one more day and night that I could breathe a little easier, and heaven forbid, 
actually enjoy my favorite month for once. Although I couldn't see it in the dark, I knew that just out of reach was a small tote bag, complete with a few basic necessities and a few extra things that hopefully wouldn't be necessary at all, short of a horrific emergency, but better safe than sorry. 11.59. Perfect. So close. I held my breath in anticipation and watched as the numbers flicked over to 12 o'clock. I exhaled and tried to slip my legs out of bed without disrupting either of the snoozers. Luckily, John could sleep through the apocalypse, and Sophie was pretty much deaf, at least when it suited her. I reached down in the dark and let my fingers slip through the handles of the pre-packed bag and turned to my side. I waved to the dirty blonde boy in his late teens, his dirt-smeared light green t-shirt and lightly torn dungarees the same as they always were. I tilted my head towards the kitchen, beckoning him to follow me, and he did, without sound or question. I turned our front doorknob as slowly as possible and opened it just enough so I could slip out into the hall without the hinges breaking their creaking halfway point. Holding onto the external handle, I let the door slide naturally back into the threshold and then turned to the boy. In the bright lights of the hall, the smallest trickle of dried blood could be seen emerging from the part in his crumpled hair. He wore only one shoe, a muddy red original low-top Chuck Taylor, his right foot bare, filthy, and scratched. Thankfully, we didn't have to go far, and even more thankfully, I was pretty sure he couldn't feel anything anyway. I motioned for him to follow me, I adjusted the bag on my shoulder, and we headed down the fourth floor hall in the direction of the back elevator. Stopping short a few doors of it, I looked at him with the warmest smile I had in my repertoire, made sure my eyes were light and genuine, and finally spoke. Don't worry, you'll be okay, I promise. He nodded and stood more primly. I cleared my throat and straightened my own posture to mirror his, and I knocked my fist solidly against one of my neighbor's doors. When no sound or movement came from the other side, I brought my knuckles back together and this time knocked with a more pleasant cadence. Some shuffling and stumbling was immediately audible, along with a mumbled curse or two, and within a moment, the door opened slowly, uncertainly, and revealed a half-asleep, middle-aged man, my neighbor, Benjamin. I think it was safe to say that seeing me outside his door at midnight was perplexing to him, but nowhere near as disorienting as when his eyes fell to my companion. I sighed a little, figuratively and literally. Oh good, you can see him. Hey, sorry to bother you so late, Ben, but you kept saying at the loft's last block party that you thought it was so cool that ghosts visited me, and you wished that they'd visit you too. Well, you're in luck. This fine young man right here needs somewhere to stay for the month. And, unfortunately, I just don't have the space for him this year. Benjamin tore his eyes off of me as I spoke and stared instead to the lad to my side, half in amazement, half in terror. I figured I ought to wrap things up quickly, lest he wake up enough to scream, or worse, tell me and my friend to beat it. I handed over the bag that I carried. Here's everything you should need to get through, and if you have any questions, just text, okay? Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. At that, I ducked backwards a few steps and headed back home. I tiptoed back into our condo and snuck into bed, impressed that I'd completed the delivery in less than seven minutes flat. Feeling hopeful, a little nervous, but mostly tired. I sighed heavily as I wiggled deeper into my pillow. John rolled over 
eyes still half closed, and asked if everything was okay. I nodded. Yeah, it's all good. Go back to sleep, baby doll. He looked at the clock and asked through a yawn, Where's Christian? As he settled his head back down. I brought him to Benjamin's for the month. I think it's a good match. Even in the darkness, I could tell that John had brought a hand up and over his eyes. Chen, you can't just loan people ghosts. He was poking fun at you when he said he wanted to see them too. I shrugged my shoulders, rolled onto my side, and as I fell into a happy, relieved, and slightly less haunted sleep, I mumbled, Well, I guess the joke's on him this time. Jennifer there from Haunted Happenstance. And I think you'll see what I mean when I say, you know, she has a voice that you could go, ah, and then go, what? Ah, what? Ah, what? Which, of course, is how everyone wants to fall asleep. But no, go seriously, go seriously, seriously go check out Haunted Happenstance with the wonderful Jennifer. Now, next in our buffet of the paranormal, for we have buffets here in England, normally at weddings, funerals, you know, that sort of thing, long tables of food. Anyway, when we move along... <laughs> <laughs> Don't know I'm talking about buffets. You can tell it's an hour in. Anyway, when we move along the buffet table, we come next to Lainey and It's Haunted What Now? And It's Haunted What Now is a really interesting premise for a show out of everything that we've covered. If this is the one that I've been like, ooh, that's an interesting little idea. Because basically what they do is they look at haunted items and objects and cursed items and objects and then follow the journey of the person who didn't know said item was haunted and see what takes place. Anyway, this is Lainey. Welcome new listeners to It's Haunted What Now? The podcast where I, Lainey Hobbs, share bone-chilling tales of haunted objects and the unsuspecting individuals who cross paths with them. Join me as we unravel the mysteries and supernatural encounters that unfold when these eerie artifacts make their way into our lives. Visit hauntedpod.com to learn more, submit your own spooky tale to be featured on the show, and connect with our ever-growing community of paranormal enthusiasts. Follow me at It's Haunted What Now on Instagram for behind-the-scenes glimpses and join the conversation. As a co-founder of the True Crime and Paranormal Podcast Festival, I'm dedicated to bringing you captivating stories that will keep you on the edge of your seat. Our next story comes from Mason Ridgway, who brings us multiple experiences from a friend of hers who seems to be linked to the supernatural in ways she can't control. I've been working with a girl that has quickly become a friend. She's opened up about some of the crazy stuff she's experienced, and I've been there to witness a few of them. After hearing her stories, I'm insanely curious about what it all means. I'll relay some of her stories the best that I can remember. One day, I came into work and she opened up to me about her weekend working alone at the office. For context, our office has a basement with a door that opens to the outside. She started by telling me that her friend came to visit. Her friend dropped some food off and they chatted for a while about the day. In the middle of their conversation, she heard the keypad being entered for the front door, which then proceeded to swing open. Both of them were confused, so she hopped up from her desk to see who was there. And no one was. No extra cars outside the door, no people, nothing. She shut the door and sat down to continue her conversation with her friend. The door swung open a second time and, just as before, no one was there. She closed the door again and this time she locked it. She told me that she was spooked at this point but felt like it was a fluke. And then she heard the keypad being pressed again. The door swung open and no one was there. Her friend left, and I can't say that I blame her, but apparently nothing happened after that and the door remained firmly shut. 
The next incident I was involved in. Honestly, I was so spooked by it, it's what brought me to tell this story in the first place. Our boss was having a meeting and get-together throughout the entire day in our basement office. Near the end, my friend and I decided to join in and hang out with everyone. With it being a bit of a celebration of the end of things, we felt like we deserved to relax a little bit. We were working on a set of vision boards when suddenly the basement door slammed open, startling everyone in the room. Within seconds, the door leading upstairs to the first floor also slammed closed. I felt like I jumped out of my skin, but no one else seemed to budge. If anything, they seemed annoyed. The door at the top of the stairs then continued to slam closed three more times, randomly and aggressively without anyone being anywhere near it. I was completely spooked, but tried to play it off as a joke, asking my friend what the hell she'd brought into the office. A few weeks prior to this, she told me that she'd seen a lot of weird phenomena, but nothing that she'd thought there was anything to be alarmed about. She told me about the house she'd been staying in with her parents. Lights would flicker and blow out to the point where her parents asked her what was going on since they'd never had that happen before she came to stay. She'd had to replace them repeatedly with no explanation. Most importantly, she told me that she's seen ghosts. The first one she told me about was a man she'd seen frequently around her house. He wore a blue plaid shirt and the first time she saw him, he was sitting at the foot of her bed. She'd woken up around three in the morning to see him sitting there. She tried to ignore him, to cover her head with a blanket, but when she opened her eyes again, he was still there. She told me she'd ended up kicking the blankets and that's when he'd stood up and disappeared into nothingness. I asked if anyone else in her family had seen him, and she said her son had. He had described the exact same outfit and had told her that he was a good guy and that he wasn't scared. And that might be all right for him, but this last story is the one that scares me the most. My friend told me she'd been driving with a friend when she was in high school, going along a backcountry road. They came across a woman, standing in the middle of the street wearing old-fashioned, all-black clothes. She told me that the woman had levitated off the pavement, floated towards the woods that flanked each side of the road, and then disappeared. She and her friend were both in shock, stopped in the middle of the street, staring in pure fear and silence before getting the hell out of there. Like I say, there are too many stories around her to be able to tell them all. My main question is, what would cause this amount of activity around her? She says she's had this happen her whole life and has no idea why. I think she deserves some answers. So it definitely sounds like your friend has some sort of link to the paranormal that most of the rest of us don't share. I kind of want to say she's haunted or she's, you know, in tune with the other side some way. It's definitely strange that she's experienced so many incidents in her life, and especially for them to be so seemingly unrelated, except for the fact that they're all happening to her or around her. Definitely something to look into if she can, and maybe she can go to a... At least in Dallas, we have psychic fairs, and so maybe she can find one local to her area and go and talk to any mediums that are out there who would be able to help her, determine if she has that gift and how to manage it. Until next time. Did you hear that? Lainey there from the wonderful It's Haunted What Now? And if there's any greater question we could ask ourselves in the paranormal world, I don't know what it is. But yeah, do go make sure you check out. Do go make sure. I'm, I'm turning into Yoda. It, it's the only possible answer. Anyway, go and make sure. Go and make sure. Make sure you go and check out Lainey's show, It's Haunted, What Now, wherever you get your podcasts. That was my terrible American accent. Anyway, 
Next, we're going to listen to the show or a clip from the show of Nathan Melissa hosting You Can See Me in the Dark. Now, what's different about this show compared to the remainders of oh, the remainders? The rest of the ones we've covered is that they do like listener phone in stories. So you get to hear the ghost story or the paranormal tale in the listener's own words, which is often the best way to consume such material, I do believe. And they do it in a very, very professional way. And I think you're really going to enjoy this clip. So without any further ado, here's Nick and Melissa, and you can see me in the dark. Hey, this is Nate. And this is Melissa. And this is You Can See Me in the Dark, a podcast about true ghost stories directly from the people who experience them. We have new stories out monthly with bonus content on our Patreon if you can't get enough. And we got a killer theme song. I'm Melissa Sweezy. And I'm Nate Reisman, and this is You Can See Me in the Dark. You can see me in the dark. In our most recent episode, Noah tells a terrifying story about growing up in the most haunted house in Bristol, England. This story is about what happened after he left. You Can See Me in the Dark presents Noah. I worked at a um, care home for old folks for a while, and uh, it was a very old building. Like, it used to be a, um, a workhouse, a Victorian workhouse. And that place was really haunted. Like, oof, I, I didn't like it there. <laughs> I really didn't like it there. There was a corridor in that, in the, like, main building of the care home, and as soon as you walked through, they, there was like a security door because the, the the residents had dementia, so they would have doors so they couldn't just walk out, you know, for safety. As soon as you walked through the door, stood in that like corridor, it was just this like horrible sensation just washes over you and everything feels heavy. It's like, like almost like a pressure pressing down on you and Ooh, I, I hated being in that in that corridor, and um, they had had a vicar come to like bless this corridor, and he had come and hung a like little wooden cross on the wall after he blessed it. And every now and then, for no reason at all, the cross would be turned upside down, or it would fall and just be on the floor. And certain members of staff refused to go in that corridor; they just would not go in there ever. And this corridor, there were like eight, eight, mm, yeah, eight bedrooms off of this corridor. And the the residents had these like pressure sensitive mats next to their bed. So if they got out of bed, it would set an alarm off and we would know they'd got out of bed. So then we could go and see to them. And sometimes when I worked a night shift, me and the other staff would be sat like drinking coffee, trying to stay awake. And all of a sudden, every single alarm for every room in that corridor would all go off all at the same time. And the first time it happened, I was like, come on, we all got to get up, everyone's awake. And one of the other staff was like, no, they're not. They're not awake. And I was like, what are you talking about? They're not, all of the alarms are going off. We need to go up there. And she's like, they're not awake. You can go up and look, but I can bet you they're all still in bed. And I was like, right then. So I went up by myself in the dark, <laughs> turning all the lights on as I went, because I was scared, because uh, I, I hated that hallway. And I go into the hallway, open the first door. No, residents in bed, fast asleep, turn the alarm off. Open the next door, residents in bed, fast asleep, turn the alarm off. And the whole time it's like beep, beep, beep. And I'm going door after door after door after door. Everyone is asleep in bed. And I'm thinking, how, how are all of these alarms being set off like what is setting these alarms off but after that like it just was kind of like a known thing like yeah that that happens that happens all the time you know there's no need to rush because nobody knows what it is but something is just 
messing with us, I guess. But that that corridor, another time I was uh, putting laundry away. I used to take laundry for and take it to the wardrobes in each room. And I stopped in the end room and like I had these huge mm, bucket buckets or baskets of clothes, dry clothes. I leave it in the first room and then I go to the next room. I like grab stuff and I go into the next room. And then I hear this mighty crash. And I'm thinking, what in the hell? What was that? It sounds like someone's trashing the room next door. And I'm thinking, but there's no one there. And I go out into the next room and I open the door and someone has grabbed these two baskets of laundry and just thrown clothes everywhere. And just all over the room. And I'm like, what the hell? How did... What did that? There's no one here. Like, there's no, there's no residents. There's no staff members. Like, what the hell is going on? And I'm like, putting, grabbing all the clothes and folding them and putting them back in the basket. And while I'm doing that, I hear another sound in the room I just came from. And I'm like, this, someone is pranking me. Like, this is someone is absolutely pranking me right now. So I, I, pull, I pull the door open like. I go really quietly and I creep out I go to the door and I just swing the door open and the clothes that I'd just taken into that room have been thrown everywhere (laughs) and I just stand there and look at it and I'm like I don't know what to do like there's no one here I'm on my own something is messing with me and I don't know what it is but it's definitely screwing with me now Um, so I just I grab the clothes and stuffed them in the basket and I took the baskets and I left and went back down to the laundry room I was like I'm not doing this now this is this is too weird I know that it the other weird things that happened to other staff members nobody said anything about this uh, that happening to them specifically but I know other times that staff members had gone into a room and they'd heard a noise in the next room and when they'd gone in there someone had opened the wardrobe and everything was on the floor so like whoever or whatever was there liked making a mess and uh, (laughs) seemed to enjoy watching because it would be like it would trick you to go into the other room and while you're in that room it would do something in the room you'd just been in, like, yeah, it was kind of like it was pranking. It made me uncomfortable, I will say. I felt afraid, um, but it was almost like, like a, almost like I could imagine someone being like, hee hee, this is so funny. Like, I'm, they're, they're going to go and look at the other room now, and while they're in there, I'm going to mess around in the other room. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, very strange. But uh, there was there was one story that kind of circulated amongst the staff. It was kind of like the most popular, I guess, ghost story. And it was a couple of year, years back when this, the, this, this hallway with the horrible sensation was actually um, like a newly converted part of the building. And when, the, when it had been converted, and um, decorators had come in to like paint it and you know prepare it so it could be used. And the, there's two guys up there working, and one of them comes down to the the like main office and is like, "I can't I can't work up here with all these children running around. They're like they're knocking things over. They're getting in the way. Like this is dangerous. There shouldn't be kids here right now." And the the receptionist looks at him, she's like, what are you talking about? Like, there are no kids here. And he's like, no, I just saw there's like two or three kids up there and they're running around and they're just making so much noise. Like, we're trying to work here. And she's like, I really don't know why you're saying that because there are no kids here. This is an old folks home, there are no kids. And he was like, oh, okay. And then the next day, these two guys were supposed to come back and continue their work, but they didn't come back. I don't know. Um, I've heard that the building, like, it was a workhouse. So it's possible that the children were sent there and possibly died there, possibly. 
I know the building, there was like a sort of outer outside building that wasn't connected to the main building, um, that, where the like laundry room was. And um, I know that they would sleep there. And sometimes late in the evening, you could, uh, you would hear a coughing coming from somewhere. I would be there on my own, like getting clean laundry and I would hear someone like really coughing, like, oh my God, if they got uh, pneumonia or something, but there is no one there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a really spooky place. I think it was the the clothes getting thrown around the room was the last rule for me because it was kind of like, not only is this scary, but it's making more work for me. <laughs> because we were stretched quite thin a lot of the time and there wasn't time to deal with these kind of mishaps. Yeah, I, and also I really didn't like being in that corridor at night. It, it, I did not feel safe in that corridor and... Um, like, I, I'm not religious, but walking in, into that corridor at like one o'clock in the morning and seeing the cross lying on the floor is a really unsettling feeling. <laughs> I imagine for anyone, whether they're religious or not, just seeing that and being being like, this, this feels uh, threatening. Um, I just, I, I'm glad I left. And there you go. That was Nate and Melissa's show, You Can See Me in the Dark. And I do love shows like that, you know, where you get... I don't know where this Cornish accent's coming from. Where you get... You know where you get to hear the ghost story in the experience's own words. Because they don't have the novelty like us podcasters do of being able to edit and stuff like that. Generally, it's like sitting in a pub with someone and them just telling you a ghost story which I think is ideal. I really like that sort of format. So well done, those guys. And go check out You Can See Me in the Dark wherever you get your shows from. Now, finally, in our little soiree of paranormal ponderances, we have none other than the birthday person themselves. Yes, indeed, the man who's celebrating a 100 shows, Chris from They're Not Shadows. Now, Chris has a very unique way of telling a story, as you're about to hear. They're all pretty darn terrifying, and you should go and check them out wherever you get your podcasts from. Now, like I said, reaching 100 podcast episodes is a hell of a milestone. You know, 90 plus 90% don't reach that anywhere near that. I think it's some stupid stat like over 80% of podcasts don't reach episode five before they give up the ghost, so to speak, pardon the pun. But, you know, this is Chris's 100th episode and that's why we're doing all this. You know, it was his idea and it's a great idea because we've basically had a terrifying tapas. That's what this is. Remember to stick around after Chris's clip because we are going to do a Becca's Reddit corner to end the show. But here is Chris. Hi, I'm Chris, the host of They're Not Shadows, a paranormal story podcast. This story is titled The Old Farm. I'm an engineer, and I don't believe in ghosts. I'm convinced they couldn't exist due to several laws of physics. Yet, something happened that I can't explain. My brother told me he'd been to an abandoned farmhouse with his partner and had an experience. As they were standing inside this very old house, she asked him, Do you really think this place is haunted? And before he could reply, he said, The house shook. Oh my God! What's happening? I don't know.
I didn't think he was lying, but I was concerned he was delusional. So, I decided to check out this farmhouse for myself. I was with a former colleague, a guy with a PhD in physics, who also does not believe in ghosts. It was a bright sunny day. And as we arrived, we could hear the wind, the nearby sheep, and the birds chirping. But as we approached the house, it all stopped. It was so sudden and obvious, we both commented. Did you notice how... Yeah, I did. We kept going, and out of an adjacent, open-sided barn, a flock of crows flew out, as if they were disturbed by something. It was like a cliché scene from a horror movie. That was weird. Yeah, weird. We got to the house. It appeared to have been abandoned for at least half a century. What furniture remained was very old, from around the Second World War and there was a strong smell of dampness and mould. We explored the upstairs rooms. Hey, look at this. A newspaper from the 50s. The reopening of the Suez Canal. 1957? Spot on. March 29th, to be precise. We came back down and systematically went through every downstairs room. Then, from the empty room that we'd both just been in, we heard something. It was unmistakably the sound of a foot scuffing the floor. We looked at each other. Without a word, we both turned and looked at the open doorway. Then from it came There was no furniture in that room. There simply wasn't anywhere anyone could have been hiding in there. It was an empty room. Should we? Yeah, we should. You can make of it what you will. We don't know what to make of it. Well, I'll tell you what I make of it, Chris. I make it that everyone should go and follow your show and get terrified in a very acoustically pleasing way. Anyway, a big thank you to everyone who took part in celebrating Chris's 100th show. And I hope you've enjoyed listening to a variety of different podcasts. Hopefully you've found something within there that you've not heard before and you want to go and check out. And, you know, You might find a new favourite show. I know there's been a few within these, just doing this sort of episode, that has become a definite on my playlist. I'm a patron of a couple of the shows we've covered. You know, there is stuff out there that you might not be privy to, and shows like this 
only help. I don't mean shows like me and me. Oh, look at me. I mean, ideas like this only help, as in, you know, sharing each other's stories and stuff. Anyway, I appreciate that this episode has been almost three times the length of our standard episodes. And also, don't get me wrong, I'm also... You know, I'm fully aware that some people are like, no, I tune in to listen to you, not to other people. But, you know, I think these things can be good once in a while. Oh, my voice is going. That's happened twice this week. That's pretty terrifying. But don't worry. We're still going to feature one of our mainstays of the show, and that is Becca's Reddit Corner. We're going to end on Becca's Reddit Corner. And is she in a good state? Well, let's see. Ladies and gentlemen, now it is time for Paranormal Reddit Corner with Becca. Okay, and even though this is a special episode where we've featured countless stories from podcasts around the world, we're of course still going to be visiting the corner which is occupied by Becca. Now, Becca's Reddit Corner I often describe as dark and dingy and she often puts me in my place and says it's a beautiful and bright and sprightly place. But one of us has been drinking. Not now. Not now. <laughs> the night before. So and, today, uh, Reddit Corner is a quiet place. <laughs> is a quiet place. <laughs> a nice, comfortable, quiet place. Yes. I'm not saying we're doing this in bed, but we might be. <laughs> um, let me put it this way. Um, I came in, I got up, I showered. Becca shouts, hello, good morning, from the bedroom. And I come in, we have a little chat. Um, and I notice it looks like she's got a deep cut from the cat. On the back of her arm, on the back of her hand, and I went, "What's that?" It turns out it wasn't blood, was it? No, it wasn't a cut from a cat. It was a pen. It was marker pen, and then we pulled the rest of your arm out to look. Yeah, and it turns out because you and your mates went to um, an adult, one of these adult bingo themed bongos bingos party night things, mm-hmm. um, you decided to go all give each other tattoos with your bingo <laughs> markers. Yeah. So, Becca's arm is covered top to bottom in red ink. Not top to bottom. Okay. Up to the elbow in... There's, there's some scribbles. Yeah. There's a heart with TNC in it. Yeah. Which is nice. I drew that. You drew that. <laughs> One of your friends lo- wrote, Becca loves Kev and cats. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you could see what sort of night was had. Like, yeah. I feel like, is that... Is that is that what we're saying about me? Is that, is that the, My redeeming feature. The, yeah, but that's not you know that's not what you're meant to do. Tattoos, you know, it's not meant to be like um like I'm looking at getting a tattoo very very soon. Um, still undecided on what it's going to be, but it's not going to say I can play the guitar and I, I, I'm also <laughs> good in social situations. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't have to be a, a, like praise. Yeah. No, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Are you aware of that? Yeah, I know. It's... At least, at least I didn't have pen on my face. Some of them had pen on their face. Well, this is, yeah, that's that's hysterical for <laughs> d- different reasons, which we discussed earlier. <laughs> anyway, are you okay to do a Reddit Corner? Yes. For the wonderful, wonderful listeners. I, uh, you know, consummate professional, the show must go on. The show must go on, even from, I was going to say your hospital bed. Oh, just okay. to say as well, hysterically, um, myself and Becca decided to take out life insurance recently, didn't we? And, um... Uh, the premium. I don't know why are you telling everyone? This. Just because it it, it's so weird. it really it makes me laugh that the premium was something like beep a month or something similar, right? And I was like, "Fucking hell!" Like now that's for beep quid. Kevin, it doesn't. No, it doesn't matter. This is so weird. It's not weird. Anyway, it is. Bro, we, it we, is. The point of it is when you break like, it can down. Can you beep this out? <laughs> Where do you want me to go from? No, seriously, just like beep the the figures. Oh, just the figures. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be including the, figure, the premium. Including the premium. Okay, for fuck's sake. Anyway, let me put it this way. Can I can I keep this figure in? It turns out that of the pre what the premium cost is, Becca's premium when so we it, split it into two would be like eight percent. Yeah. Yeah, literally yours was like seven times mine. Yeah. Genuinely. Yeah. Yeah. Bleep the figures out. I can't believe you've had to make me find a bleep noise and use it. Unbelievable. Yeah, do you want to use this? Beep. Yeah, well, actually, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's worked out quite well. Okay, thank you for that. So anyway, we are going to do a tale from Reddit. Mm-hmm. And this one that I'm going to hand to you is, it caught my attention because, one, it's short, and obviously you're in, you're covered in biro and stuff, and 
it's not bad. Huh? Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're covered in oh, okay. Oh, yeah, whatever. Um, it's a felt tip. Felt tip pen. Anyway, this is about mimics, which is an interesting thing. Now, you won't know what a mimic is, but there are recent. You addition. won't know what a mimic is. You won't know what a mimic is. There you go. I don't but know. well, there you go. Uh, well, yeah, kind of, but like a spiritual copycat. There you go. Right. Have a read. Have a read. <clears throat> Welcome to Reddit Corner with Becca. You couldn't be any quieter if you tried. Proper don't start, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> the title of this story is Mimic Responded to Me? Question mark. Go on, I, like, I like the uh, inflection in your voice. Thank you. Let's begin. Let's begin. This was around 10 years ago, but I still remember it clearly. I was living at home with my family, parents and siblings. I was pretty close with my brother and we would regularly hang out. He lived in the basement, so I would typically go down there to see him. I got home from something, maybe work, and walked halfway down the basement steps and stopped on the landing. I yelled down there, Josh, are you home? He responded, yeah, what's up? It sounded just like him. I walked down there and he wasn't home. I called him and he was in the next town over. I also heard my name whispered, but that's about it for me anyway. I wonder to this day why it did this. I'm guessing it was just screwing with me. My brother said there was a spirit in the house and he would see it, but I didn't know if he was messing with me or not. However, years later, he still says he did. He told me he had a spirit that was attached to him or followed him or something. He said its name was Samuel and it stayed in the attic, but was dormant most of the time. He might have been messing with me about the other stuff, but I know what I heard that day. Oh, yeah. Sammy in the attic, eh? Yeah. So, a mimic, interestingly, well, as you can tell, it doesn't take a genius to figure out what a mimic spirit is meant to be. So, it mimics a person. Yeah. So, for example, if you heard me shout from downstairs, I'm home, mm. and you were like, okay, and then an hour later, my keys went on the door, and you were like, you shouted. Mm. And it's a new sort of phenomenon. I was talking about this recently, like the way... Um, without rehashing old ground, but in the way we all know the certain tropes of paranormal entities, allegedly, like poltergeists, like um, uh, the white lady, like vengeful spirits, screaming skulls, and ones that want revenge. But there's no real new world take on this, where there should be, because we've got now got the hat man, the shadow man, the mimic, the skinwalker. So nothing you guys won't put down to the being as paranormal. <laughs> <laughs> no, because the world is paranormal. <laughs> Even that ring on your arm is paranormal. <laughs> so, what would you believe? What would you think is the case there with our our man who's heard his name? I think it's. Um, I think we underestimate how much we see in here, what we expect to see in here. Okay, like aud- audible pareidolia. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I think you're right to a point. I do think what you're right to a point. For example, visual pareidolia, the amount of times I see our cat and it's not our cat, it's like a pair of shoes or your bag yeah. or whatever else. Mm. And it does make me think, though, as well, you know, I'm not saying that in this case, but, um, yeah, but it's an interesting thing. From a non-paranormal take, and our listeners can all to a person attest that this has happened to them, I'm sure. If you sat there with headphones on, there's been definitely at least one occasion if you're in the house with them on, you took one headphone out and shouted, what? And then said to someone, did you not shout me? Yeah, you do that quite a few times. I do that quite a few times. Now, I don't put that down to a mimic spirit. No. But at the same time, you know, that it, there's an unclarity when I say, did you just shout me, as opposed to me hearing and responding. Mm. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Anyway, I think we best let you know that the, the neighbour's cat just jumped up on the bed. Yeah, she is. You come to see us. Come to join us in Red Corner. <laughs> and got some pears on the mic there. Are you going to fix it up there again? I think it, I don't really, I didn't do it. I think nope. she just I know I mean, put it close to her. No, she's just going about today. Yeah, I'm just going about mine. Didn't stop you recording me. Yeah, but... <laughs> She just rubbed her nose all over that. That'd be dead loud and not <laughs> proper bangy. Best anyway, from me, Annoying. from Becca, and from the the newest member of Red Corner, the <laughs> neighbour's cat. Yes, she is. Thank you. And are you going to say goodbyes? Yes. Thank you for joining Red Corner with Becca.
And I don't mean say goodbyes. Oh, but just to touch on... Um, yeah, so the... seriously, guys, you know what we always say? He, like, keeps threatening to kill me. Yeah, I'm, but this I'm is the point. Ask. Now there's life insurance involved. You proper so... have to investigate it. So, but seriously, Becca left to go for this bingo thing, right? With all, all the mates came here first for a drink. Then they all left. Mm. I went downstairs about an hour later. Um, made the cat some soup. Didn't notice this thing at the time. I went back down four hours later. And it turns out the left hob was on. Hang on. Right, so I didn't use the left hob. So I was like, oh, I must have just knocked it on by accident. Right, fine. Mm. If you went down and you did the soup, maybe you knocked it on? No. What do you mean, no? Well, like, well the thing... Because the soup is right next to Because my the point hob. is that your subconscious is trying to kill me to gain the insurance money. But why would it... There'd be no benefit to me killing myself. Well, I, I mean, think, I love you on that, but I'm, I don't want to give you the... Well, I'm, I'm just thinking, all, I don't think there's any motive here. I think, because the soup is right next to that button for the hob, I think you've knocked it on. Well, I haven't. Well, you don't know that. Well, what's more... Conv- yeah, let's ask, let's yeah. ask as a genuine question. What's more of a convincing story, right? Because what else was right next to the hob? Glasses, because it's where the sink is. How many glasses? Five? Six glasses that were put there... After six drunken girls left the house. So, was it the man who came down and picked up some cat soup and put it in a bowl? Or was it well, one I of did the, the six glasses. drunken it's not girls? Like, no, it's not like everyone filed away. I put the glasses there. Okay, was it the one drunken Becca? But you don't, but you don't need to be right next to the oven to put the glasses there. Look, I'm not saying it wasn't me. I might have knocked it on onto one. It's not the hob I used, so I know I didn't leave it on because it's not the hob I used. I might have knocked it on, but I'm all saying it's equally likely it was you because you stand there in that exact position and do the soup, so it could have been you. But that's how I noticed it was on. Anyway, no, no, afterwards you noticed it uh, later. You there said you, are no you mistakes, said, You Becca. said you didn't notice at first, didn't you? You said you didn't notice, so maybe you didn't notice because it wasn't on. You've knocked it on, you've only I, noticed it. you know what, I've got a genuine, genuine feeling these podcasts are going to be played in a court someday, seriously, to yeah, see. Yeah, I think that because I'm going to die in suspicious circumstances. No, 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 because the house will burn down and I'll be in it. <laughs> yourself. Well, we'll see. It wouldn't be convenient if... Um, uh, and may I bring to the court's attention that the indoor cat... Suddenly was allowed outside on that day. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you for letting us into your lovely corner. You're welcome. Tati bye. Goodbye.